you can start the recording, that'd be great, Magdalena. Mm, thank you. And first things first here, I just want to um, celebrate. Can you put your video on for, for a minute, V? I I just want to celebrate um, her name showing up as Veronica. Um, we, we call her Magdalena. It's her birthday today. And um, she's such a light in my life. She uh, helps me with, with uh, my business. And I'm so grateful for her and just want to give a shout out. Happy birthday to you, V. I love you so much. And um, to our other Aries, I know Seth and, and Elizabeth also had birthdays last week. So celebrating our, our Aries brothers and sisters who have had to go through this. Um, and Nikita too, there you're here. Um, and um, yeah, so, so many of you that are such lights in, in my life and I'm so grateful and um, we look forward to celebrating you properly in person soon enough. <laughs> and anybody I missed. <laughs> so, um, with that celebration kickoff, um, I want to uh, introduce um, myself and the series briefly. So welcome to the Rise in Resiliency um, final, uh, final kind of guest, uh, guest presenter, guest uh, presenter is such a weird word, guest angel. Going with that, um, Elizabeth Wolf we have with us tonight. This is um, the sixth one in the last uh, three weeks. I know many of you have made it to many of these and I'm really looking forward to what tonight has to uh, bring, bring to us. Uh, my name is Aria. I am a facilitator and a coach supporting folks in their leadership and stepping into their, their power in uh, creating the visions that, that our hearts hold for the world that we are dreaming awake together. And um, I'd love to start us with uh, just a little grounding just to come together for, for a moment, inviting us all to let our eyes lower and beginning to connect to the breath, just noticing the natural rhythm of your breath in this moment and connecting to your heart as you breathe. Noticing what it would be like to begin to breathe a little bit slower and a little bit deeper from your heart in this moment. With your awareness centered here in the breath, slow and deep. Checking in with your heart, what it's like here. And then bringing to mind someone or something in your life that you feel grateful for. And making a sincere attempt to activate the physical sensation of care, appreciation for whoever or whatever it is that comes to mind. Noticing what it's like for your physical body to experience the sensation, whatever is available to you around appreciation or gratitude in this moment. Just seeing if it feels like low volume, mid volume, high volume, just noticing it without any judgment. And seeing in this place, if there's any movement that would feel really nourishing to your body, maybe your body wants to stay still or maybe it wants to 
twist or turn or shake, allowing yourself to move in whatever way feels nourishing to you. And only as you feel ready, allowing your eyes to gently begin to flicker open. Thank you. And so, here we are, um, here we are in this moment with this, just totally wild series of events <laughs> happening in the world. And um, really wanna acknowledge that we've, we've been in it now for a few weeks, many of us in um, some kind of social distancing, isolation, staying at home mode and uh, um, week, weeks of it to, to come from the, from the looks of things, um, if not longer. And so, um, yeah, I just wanna, wanna um, speak to the, the intention behind these gatherings, to idea of rising and resiliency. And uh, resiliency is a word that Elizabeth Wolf uses a lot, and I, one of the many reasons I adore her. And um, it's uh, it's in in moments like like this when when we do have for many of us a lot of time to go inward um, that uh, uh, there's an opportunity to cultivate aspects of ourself um, in the in the realms of the the mind the emotions and our spiritual selves. Um, to create resiliency that can ripple and support our, our physical body and our immune systems as well. So um, the, the body of work that, um, that Elizabeth is connected to somatic experiencing is very near and dear to my heart. It has um, been a modality that has helped me uh, heal some major uh, childhood trauma from a fire that I was in. And it's very powerful and profound work to work with the nervous system in this way. And um, so I'm really, really excited to, to share her, her wisdom and, and medicine with, um, with everybody here and, and those who are gonna watch this recording. Um, uh, what to say about Elizabeth? Um, she's a beam of light and amazing and, um, uh, really pioneering an intersection um, in healing modalities that I have a profound, deep respect for. So, um, yeah, you all, you all will, if you don't know her already, um, enjoy. <laughs> and if you do, I know you will enjoy. So I'll hand it over to you, Lily. <laughs> Thanks, Arya. Yeah, and thank, I just want to yeah, say thank you to Arya for organizing this whole series that I'm an, uh, that I'm honored to be a part of. So this is the last of a, a several uh, session series that Arya pulled together kind of magically, somewhat last minute when this all unfolded. So she's um, a very magical being. And so if you don't know Arya, now you do. And I hope you check out her work as well. And I'm really grateful to be in community with her and be weaving together. So welcome to everybody. Um, I go by Elizabeth or Lily, so if you're hearing both, that's, that's me. I, I use either, either name. Um, and I am um, honored to be offering this little practice session tonight. And really what I um, am going to offer is kind of part info session or part info sharing about the nervous system and about the body. And as, you know, the way that the body um, responds to traumatic stress and um, some of the things that we're dealing with collectively and then also um, we'll we'll spend a good chunk of the time actually just doing practice so hopefully you'll leave feeling uh, more resourced and more regulated 
and can take some of these tools with you and I'll follow up as well after this evening with some resources via email and you'll have my contact information if there's anything uh, that I can do to support you. Um, so for now, um, I just uh, welcome you to make any adjustments so that your body is maybe like 10 to 15% more comfortable or more supported, more at ease. So if there's anything that you can do to facilitate that, now's a great time and any other moment is a great time for that too. <laughs> um, so even if you have to get up at some point um, and walk around, like if you're sort of at your limit with screen time, <laughs> it's very understandable. Um, and so feel welcome to turn your video off at any point, feel welcome to get up and move around uh, and feel welcome to like just reposition your body, even if it's just a subtle adjustment here and there, a pillow here, you know, a blanket there. These little things um, make a big difference and we tend to override um, our desire for these types of adjustments because of the way that we're socialized to kind of suppress uh, the messages of the body in in order to sort of keep um, keep going, uh, keep keep producing whatever it is that um, that is you know it, whatever it is that we think we need to do that's more important than taking care of the body, <laughs> right? Um, so uh, with that, I also want to invite you to just take a great big breath together. So um, I'm going to invite you to inhale in through your nose and take a great big sigh out through your mouth. And we're not going to hear each other per se, but we're all going to still do it together. And I hope it feels good. So when you're ready, just take a nice deep inhalation through your nose. <sighs> and let's do that like a couple more times. So just inhaling in through your nose and exhaling out through your mouth and make a nice big audible sigh. <sighs> and just notice how that feels to take that deeper breath. And then I just invite you to um, check in with like the mood of your body. Like if you were to describe the mood of your body in one word, what would it be? And you're welcome to share that in the chat. So what's the mood of your body in this moment? If you could put a word to it. Or maybe there's no word, maybe there's just a feeling and just checking in with yourself in that way can, can be enough. But feel welcome to share in the chat if you want to. And I'll, yeah, I welcome you to share anything in the chat. I may or may not be able to respond to it, but I welcome you to share. There we go. And also feel welcome to like witness each other. If you feel like something that someone shared resonates, you're welcome to like reflect that. Um, great, so we have happy, relaxed, settling, supported, calm, excited, relaxed duality, unpretzeling, nice, <laughs> diffuse, charged, vibey, excited. Yeah, great. And there's no like right or wrong answer. Or there's no right or wrong, right? Like, you know, check in, it's like, whatever you're feeling right now in this moment and whatever you've been feeling in the last three or four weeks, whatever you've been feeling every day and every moment of your life is okay, <laughs> right? So um, however you're feeling is, is totally welcome. And I think that in and of itself is a pretty radical statement just to, to like feel that however you're showing up and whatever you're experiencing, is okay and that we can we're actually going to befriend our bodies during this time together in perhaps a way that is is new to you maybe not right and and i hope that it's not but it but it's new, it's new for me relatively speaking to really truly befriend my body and to welcome how i'm feeling and in a in a compassionate and a curious way um so um I want to share, well, first, before I share some information just kind of about trauma physiology and the body, I want to just um, give a nod to my teachers and to the lineages that um, have informed my body of work and my praxis. So I just, um, you know, want to name that I um, am someone that has struggled with um, illness, chronic illness, um, trauma, and found my way to yoga when I was 21 um, because I didn't know what else to do. 
to heal to heal trauma. And as a as a white racialized person, um, I didn't know what my ancestors practiced to take care of their body and to heal from trauma. And so I was, you know, privileged and grateful to find yoga. And um, that was a practice that allowed me to heal in many ways and allowed me to, in, in many ways, get started on this journey of befriending my body. Fast forward to becoming an anti-racism educator. And I realized like, oh, this practice of yoga is not from my people. It's like, I'm this white woman practicing someone else's lineage. And so um, I've had to really re-examine my relationship to yoga and, and also start to like decolonize, if you will, my own uh, relationship to my ancestors. And I mention that because um, our bodies are connected to our ancestors and our bodies are connected to the earth. And many of us lost touch with our ancestors and with our ancestral practices many generations ago, um, particularly those of us who identify as white. And so um, I just invite you to weave that complexity in as we think about like healing trauma and being resilient and thinking about the body in terms of um, you know, practices that support us. Many of the practices that I'm gonna to share tonight ultimately are traced back to people of color cultures somewhere in the world, where it, whether it's yoga or other forms of somatic practice. And, and yet also, um, there's also this way in which all of us, regardless of our cultural background and our racial background, like if you go far back enough, there are indigenous ways that we're earth-based and body-based. And so in many ways, we're sort of all trying to attune to practices in a respectful and reverent way that can help us remember how to be in relationship with our bodies in a good way. And my philosophy is that when we're in right relationship with our bodies, we're going to be way more likely to be in right relationship with other people's bodies and with the body that is the earth, right? Because if you think about it, if you're dominating your own body, right, and you're suppressing your own desire um, or your own needs, like what happens typically like when we pretend like we don't feel pain or pretend like we don't have needs or desires? It's usually not pretty, right? <laughs> like it comes out in some kind of way. And so, um, I'm sure, yeah, it all bottles up exactly. And then it comes out and it gets distorted and we don't live into the values that we say we, we want to live into, right? We, we don't embody like who we say we want to be because there's all this suppressed energy and it's coming out in these different unhelpful ways. And so um, this is why trauma physiology is really helpful to understand because we live in a society that teaches us to not listen to the body, to suppress the body, and to prioritize the rational mind. Um, and so that in some ways, that's like in and of itself kind of a trauma response, because if you don't pay attention to something, then you can sort of pretend like it's not there, and then you don't have to deal with it. Again, not a long-term sustainable strategy, right? But it's, it's, a, it's a trauma response. And so, um, the lineages that I am going to draw from are, in addition to yoga, um, the work of generative somatics, which I highly recommend you check out if you're interested in this work of somatics. They're based in California. And then somatic experiencing, which is what Aria mentioned, and that's um, an institute based in Denver, Colorado, that was started by a man named Dr. Peter Levine. And um, I, I'll speak mostly from that um, lineage, and I'll just share that um, Dr. Levine studies wild animals, right? And what he has noticed about wild animals is that they don't get post-traumatic stress syndrome. They don't get PTSD, right? And why is that? Why do animals not get PTSD? Why do they essentially not hold on to trauma? Yeah, I just saw Seth like move around like this. <laughs> yeah, so and feel welcome to interact and, and participate via the chat if you, if you want to, but also no pressure. Um, 
yeah, they know how to release it. Exactly. They instinctively know how to ground. They discharge it. Yes, Autumn, exactly. So wild animals in the wild, and you can, you can see this to some degree in domestic animals, but the domestic animals have been, you know, domesticated, so they've lost touch with some of their wildness, right? Um, not as much as us as humans, but um, some, to some degree. And so when you look at wild animals in their natural habitat, when they experience a traumatic experience, they basically, as long as they survive, obviously, they find a relatively safe environment and they discharge it. They discharge the energy that was required to survive the experience. And so um, that, is the, that is the thing that we have forgotten how to do as humans, right? We have forgotten how to discharge trauma, and so then it gets stuck in our nervous system. And so what are the, what are the this, you know, some people say three, some people say there are four. I'll say there are five different, like, survival energies, particular survival strategies that our bodies are programmed to um, call on when we experience tra trauma. And so feel, feel welcome to put those in the chat if you know what they are. So what are the, what are the primary survival um, strategies? Yeah, fawn. So fawning is like appeasing. So like pleasing someone or appeasing. Another way to say that is fawning fight. Yep. So that's like a mobilization response, right? A defense mechanism. Flight. Yep. It's like get the heck out of there, right? Run away. And then freeze. Yeah. And freeze is like basically like play dead, right? So that's a lot of times in the wild, what we see where like, you know, an animal may be being chased by a predator. It's not fast enough, so it's gonna play dead. The predator then loses interest and the animal, you know, bounces off and, you know, discharges all of that pent up energy that kind of got tamped down. Cause you think about it, if you're running super fast, like an Impala, right? And then all of a sudden you're playing dead, all that, fight energy, or I'm sorry, that flight energy gets tamped down, right? And and because you go into a freeze. And so then the animal has to go and actually discharge that and basically bring the nervous system back into regulation. And dissociate is the fifth one. And dissociate, the way that I talk about dissociate is like, your body is here, but your your consciousness is like somewhere else, like on a different continent or in a different like plane, <laughs> right? So it's a brilliant strategy because it's, it minimizes pain. And so I, I felt like three or four weeks ago when, like, when social distancing start, first started, I could tell that I was sort of dissociating once in a while because it was like so much to adjust to. And I could tell that like I wasn't in my body all the time. And now I'm kind of like you, you know, calling on my practices and you know, getting more grounded. But it's, it's, a brilliant, it's a brilliant strategy. And I really look at all of these strategies as magic. I call them magic, like, unapologetically, because they are. They're brilliant survival strategies that were, you know, that evolved in our nervous systems that kept our ancestors alive. And here we are, right? Like, we are here because our ancestors survived, <laughs> right? And, and like, they are so happy that we made it, <laughs> right? And that we're here representing our lineages um, because they survived. Like it's a, it's a success. It's been a success that, that we're here, right? <laughs> and so there's obviously a lot of like stigma and, and shame attached to like these words or not obviously, but perhaps they, in your experience, there has been, um, you know, just culturally some, um, you know, shame or stigma attached to trauma or attached to these words, but I just want to invite us all to like approach these strategies from a place of like deep respect and appreciation and, and, and reverence, right? Because they're, it's pretty amazing to like, to be able to survive some of the things our ancestors have survived and in many ways to be able to live through and, and figure out how to be resilient through what we're experiencing now as a, as we um, uh, adapt to COVID-19 and this collective trauma that we're navigating together, right? And so, um, yeah, 
Right. Yeah, exactly. So social distancing is really like spatial solidarity or physical distancing, whereas really, you know, the, the need for social togetherness is, is huge. So I am grateful for that, that distinction that, that someone just lifted up. Yeah. And so what happens when we experience a collective trauma, like what's happening right now with COVID-19 and the uncertainty and the changes that are happening daily and just the, the, the reasonable fear and the grief, right? There's like so much happening that's out of our control and there's loss of jobs, there's loss of routine, there's loss of people, there's loss of like, you know, just a sense of, of like grounding, <laughs> sanity, whatever it is, right? And so what happens is like, that's all very real and reasonable. And anytime we experience a trauma, it's also going to be activating and interacting with past trauma. And when I say past trauma, I mean like past experiences that we have had that were too much too fast or overwhelming, right? Um, like a basic definition of trauma is like something that was too much too fast, right? Too much too fast. And so um, a lot of times what I've been finding lately is like, and I'm someone that likes to spend a lot of time alone. I like solitude. I have a lot of limitations health wise. So I'm not someone that's been flying around the world, you know, until recently. Um, but not having the uh, ability to leave the house as freely can feel like I'm trapped, which can trigger experiences in my life where I have felt trapped. Does that make sense? Right? And so this is just one way in which the circumstances right now is not only creating certain constraints and limitations on our lives and on our bodies, but it's also potentially calling up old stuff that may have happened like, you know, when we were little or a different part in our life that we haven't even thought about, or maybe we've done a lot of healing around it, but all of a sudden it's like, oh, why do I feel like I can't, you know, you know, why am I tired all the time? Or why do I feel irritated? Or why do I feel anxious or like trapped? Well, because <laughs> there's all this new, um, these new, this new like uh, terrain that's bringing old stuff up. And so um, again, that's where the invitation to just befriend what's happening is so important because um, when we approach any kind of distress from a place of like, criticism or shame it's kind of like throwing gas on the fire right and it's easier said than done right because a lot of times we weren't that wasn't modeled to us like we some of sometimes it's like hard to know how to actually have compassion for oneself like it sounds good right but it's like okay but how do I actually feel compassion for myself like I know how to feel compassion for other people but how do I turn that towards myself right and yet that's the invitation is to learn to be kind to ourselves when we're having a hard time because that's actually essential for self-regulation. And so while the five survival strategies, fight, flight, freeze, appease, dissociate, are brilliant, they're not where we wanna hang out all the time, right? They're not where we wanna get stuck and they're not necessarily always gonna be the best option. Like sometimes we are going to need those things and thankfully they're always going to be there in our back pocket. But this, uh, this practice together today that I'm offering is to give us more choices and to help us to be more aware of when those, those strategies are being implemented by our nervous systems and to be able to have more choice in that moment to be like, do I really want to like fight right now? <laughs> is that really the best strategy? Or do I actually need to like go self-soothe in this other way, right? Or do I really need to go take a walk? Or do I really need to call a friend? Or do I really need to like wrap myself up in a blanket like a burrito and swaddle myself <laughs> so that I can feel <laughs> a little bit more okay? Um, and so really it's like this, this work of trauma resilience is what I would call it, is about like creating a toolbox that gives us more choices and more options so that we're not as likely to go from like zero to 60 and just 
like reflexively go into a trauma response or a survival strategy that may have been really useful at one time. Obviously it was because here we are, but it may not be the most effective and the most helpful tool or practice to help you feel actually uh, resilient in the moment. Because the goal of trauma resilience is actually to feel calm and alert, not just alert and not just calm. Because if you think about it, being inappropriately calm in a dangerous situation, not smart, right? It's like under active, if you will. And then conversely, right, if you're overly vigilant or hyper vigilant or hyper aroused all the time, it's exhausting. And you're going to think that every single sound that you hear and every single thing that you see is a potential threat when most of the time, you know, hopefully that's not the case. And of course, like there are people living in like acute danger in the world and that's um, a whole nother situation. But if you're relatively safe and it's possible for you to attune to, um, to that, that like relative level of safety, then that's the work of trauma resilience so that you can be as calm and grounded as possible while still being alert and aware. Does that make sense? Yeah, I appreciate Alex, you're nodding, it's helpful feedback. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, so I'm, I'm gonna stop talking soon and we're gonna get in some practice. Let me just reference my notes and to see if there's, oh, I wanna just not make a nod to my um, somatic experiencing mentor, Sage Hayes, who has a wonderful body of work. Um, their website is embodiedliberation.com if you want to check them out. Um, but they um, recently started using the, they started basically including like a sixth strategy, which is essentially what I'm talking about with trauma resilience. So we have fight, flight, freeze, like those are the main three survival strategies that are the most, you know, well known. And then we have appease and dissociate. Well, they would add free, like, so there's fight, flight, freeze, but then there's also free. Like, do you feel free and do you feel a sense of freedom in the moment to actually move from a place of discernment and choice and agency as opposed to feeling like your nervous system is on autopilot? Does that make sense? Cool. Um, all right. And the other thing I just want to mention, too, that's sort of like part of my philosophy to embodiment work is that like capitalism and the, like systemic oppression does not want us to be in our bodies, right? Because if, we in our, if we're in our bodies, we're much more likely to feel the discomfort and the pain that's caused by the inequities and the violence of the system that we live in. And if we're in our bodies, we're more likely to then like speak up on behalf of ourselves and on behalf of people that are being oppressed, right? And so it's a strategic thing for oppressive systems to have people be disembodied. And that, uh, you know, that all of that is like, there's tons of history of trauma, you know, like cultural and societal trauma, like intergenerational trauma, that is a part of why that is how our culture functions. Um, but the way that I look at embodiment work is that it's a, it's a countercultural, um, act of resistance and resilience to come back to the body. So while it's magic to be able to leave the body, right, and it's brilliant that we can leave the body, it's actually our responsibility and our, our, um, uh, our right, right, to come back to the body. Because when we come back to the body is actually when we get to enjoy having a body, <laughs> even though sometimes it's hard to enjoy the body because the body can feel a lot of pain and there's trauma there. So I know that it's not like a simple thing, but in a sense, like we have the right to at least try to come back and to try to feel better and to try to feel safe and maybe even pleasurable in our bodies, right? Like that's <laughs> to me, like that's a huge, hugely badass way to resist the system, the systems of oppression in our, in our society is to actually enjoy having a body <laughs> and like come home to our bodies rather than being like numbed out and um 
and disconnected from our bodies, which then again is like going to make us more likely to be disconnected from other people's bodies and other people's humanity and trees and water and earth, right? And so the more we come home to our bodies, the more we come home to our humanity and to each other and to the unseen world of uh, energies that, uh, you know, exist throughout all of nature. Unseen meaning like the spirits of the trees, for example. We can see the trees, but sometimes we don't see that the tree, that the tree has a spirit, right? But we're, if, our, if we're in our bodies, then we're more likely to feel the consciousness of the tree, right? Like I hugged a, a tree yesterday for like five minutes and I could feel <laughs> the consciousness of the tree like hugging me back, right? Like I felt like the tree could recognize me just like I was able to recognize the consciousness of a tree. So it was this really beautiful exchange. Um, yes, decolonization by personal embodiment. Exactly, Ariana. Yes, exactly. We're, we're talking about decolonizing our relationship to the body. And yes, it's so subtle and so simple and yet so powerful and hard to do because again, it's like not the norm, right? Beautiful, yeah. Um, Beautiful. So, um, and I want to just mention this too. I'll put this in the chat, but if you really want to nerd out about, um, about the nervous system, this would be like a whole course. You can check out um, polyvagal theory by Stephen Por Porges. Um, he's like this brilliant dude that has this whole like body of work about the nervous system and how, how it works. Cause the nervous system is like really complex actually. And um, I'm kind of, you know, simplifying it in certain ways, but um, check out his work if you're interested. Yeah. Um, okay, so as we shift into like more practice, I just want to say that um, the way, so 70% of trauma healing is actually about supporting the body to feel safe. So I'm going to say that again, 70% of trauma healing which I'll also, I'm kind of using trauma healing and trauma resilience kind of synonymously. There are distinctions, but they're, you know, they're very interconnected concepts. Like to heal trauma is to also basically like not be triggered all the time and to be able to stay in your body more often if possible. And so again, 70% of trauma healing or trauma resilience work is about supporting the body to feel safe. Supporting the body to feel safe. And so that's what we're gonna do um, for, the, for the last part of our time together. And so um, I just invite you to like make any other adjustments. I, I love my, one of my uh, mentors, Vanessar Tarakali in California, she, she, she says like, our bodies need attention and care like animals and children. Right, like, what would what would it be like to to relate to our bodies as we as we do to like children? And I'm not saying like parenting is easy, <laughs> but but it's easy for us to understand the needs of a child, right? Like they're dependent on us, and so it's like, of course, we need to like show up for them and be attentive to them and give them the care that they need. Well, our bodies are sort of similar to that, and so I just love that because it's like. Um, helpful to, to just recalibrate our relationship to our body in a more compassionate way. Um, so, uh, let's see. So the goals of the practices that I want to share are to, um, to help us build our capacity to stay within our window of tolerance more often. And our window of tolerance is like where we can basically stay in the here and now without going into like a huge trauma response. And so a couple of the like purposes of these like practices would be to basically um, befriend sensation. So basically when you're having a trauma response, actually let me ask this as a question, you can put it in the chat. So how do you know, what are some of the sensations, emotions, or impulses that your body experiences when you're feeling outside of your window of tolerance? So when you know you're having some kind of like trauma response or some kind of activation, what does that feel like in your body? And you can just, you know, put one word, two words, three words, 
yeah, tightness in chest, increased heart rate. Yep, tightness in throat, rapid heart rate. Lots of stuff in the chest and throat, yep. Rushing, tingling, anxiety, overwhelm, dizziness. Yeah, so like this is what we would call the trauma vortex, right? <laughs> All of those kind of unpleasant words that usually indicate that we're experiencing some kind of activation. And so um, what we're going to do right now is engage with some practices that um, to, to counter that and help regulate our nervous system. And one of the best ways to regulate our nervous systems is actually to co-regulate with each other. And even over a Zoom call, there's co-regulation happening. Like when someone first jumped on tonight and there was like a handful of us gathered, she said, I'm so grateful for this beautiful energy that's starting to gather in this space, right? This space, this virtual space. There was already a palpable sense of co-regulation because we were connecting with each other's energy even across time and space, right? And so when we are challenged by this experience of social distancing or social um, spatial solidarity, whatever you want to call it, physical distancing, we have to find ways to still co-regulate with each other. And so I'm just gonna offer this first one, which is a mirroring exercise where I'm just gonna do this and I welcome you to mirror me. Yeah, great. And so what this is doing is it's hopefully activating our mirror neurons in our brain, which is telling us that we are engaging with another human being that is reflecting what we're doing back to us and we're in a social relationship with each other in this way. There's a feedback loop happening. Yeah. And let's change it up a little bit. Let's see if we can be responsive and adaptive, right? Yeah, great. And then I'm just going to ask you to keep mirroring me. I'm just going to situate myself a little higher and I'm just going to like this, and then I'm gonna put this hand on my thigh and this hand on my thigh. So just kind of mirror me. And this is also a great like cross crawl type movement where we're engaging the left and right hemispheres of the body and the brain. So it's really good for coordination. Anyone already feeling a little bit better now that we're actually doing something? <laughs> Good. Yeah, good. Great. So then um, the next thing I want to do is um, I want to just invite you to try a little bit of um, orienting to your senses. And so I want you to just actually, instead of looking at the screen, I want you to look around your space with your eyes, because your eyes are actually one of the most primary senses in terms of the level of activity and engagement when you're orienting to your environment. Your eyes are super active, prominent. So just noticing like in your environment, what are the resources that are the most resonant for you? Like what do your eyes, what are your eyes drawn to and what in your environment feels the most supportive? Whether it's a plant or a candle or a piece of artwork or something outside of a window. And feel free to look like all the way back behind you. It's really helpful for the body to feel safe, even if you can see behind you in your video, right? But there's something about physiologically actually giving yourself the opportunity to look behind you rather than just overriding, you know, your, your body's impulse to really orient in all 360 degrees, right? Because that's what we would do if we were an animal, right? An animal doesn't like animals don't do screen time, right? <laughs> animals don't just like sit in one position and never look behind them, right? And so it's actually really helpful to like incorporate that into your practice or into your just daily flow of like giving yourself a chance to actually orient and notice like what's actually in your environment that feels safe and that feels supportive. And you can do that with smell as well. So I don't know if anybody uses like essential oils, but um, if I can't get outside for whatever reason, um, I love like cedarwood oil or spruce oil, particularly because they, they kind of transport me to the woods. And so just even taking on, you know, an oil or something that, you know, is a positive, uh, smell for you and bringing that into your senses can feel really grounding and regulating. 
Same thing with taste, right? Like drinking tea, music, of course, through the ears, and then touch is huge, right? And so does anyone have a weighted blanket? Yeah, yeah. So especially right now, because we're not experiencing a lot of touch, which is really challenging for some of us, some of, it may, some of us maybe are relieved, some of us maybe are like neutral, but some of us are really struggling without hugs, right? And so you can actually use a weighted blanket to actually create that feeling of uh, pressure on the skin and on the, on the body through the sense of touch. You can also give yourself a hug, right? Which is actually not just like a cheesy thing, it's like real. Like to feel held <laughs> with yourself, it, it can create a felt sense of containment and a felt sense of being met, right? And hugged. And again, you can hug a tree and you can hug the earth, right? You can lay down on the earth, on your belly or on your back and feel the pressure of the earth against your body and against your skin. And that's also a form of touch. Um, another way to, to work with touch and to help the body feel a, a felt sense of touch is submerging in water. So like um, submerging in a, in a lake or a pond or a bath or a shower and noticing how the water feels against your skin through your sense of touch. Um, hugging a pillow can be really helpful. So if you have a pillow, you can try this. And just like squeezing a pillow or even having like a pillow on your lap can actually also kind of create a felt sense of uh, kind of like that, again, that containment, that, that felt sense of being met and having something to kind of press into. Um, pushing against things can be really helpful. So if you, um, if you can like press against a pillow or extend your arms really slowly out in front of you, that can really be helpful because again, a lot of times when, we're, when we have limited choices, like we can't leave our house as much as we would like to, we can feel trapped. And so extending our arms out like this really slowly can help us feel a sense of agency because we're extending a boundary essentially. This is kind of like a boundary repair uh, exercise. And so just notice how you feel. This can be sometimes quite intense. And so if it brings anything up for you, just like back out of it and really be present with what it's bringing up for you. Um, otherwise, just kind of retract your arms really slowly. So it's kind of like slow motion. And just notice how that felt. And you're welcome to um, put anything in the chat if you have any feedback about how that felt. Um, again, it's just, it's a way of the body coming into a, a, a sort of, um, body, it's the body language of no, basically. So it's like setting a boundary with the body. And a lot of times in our lives, we haven't had uh, the ability to say no or to set a boundary or our boundaries were violated um, despite our best attempts to set them. And so especially when trauma is being triggered up in these kinds of collective trauma experiences, extending the arms in this no can feel really therapeutic and it can help us feel a greater sense of power and agency even again even when we're dealing with these limitations um, based on the reality of what's going on uh, collectively great yeah i felt like what i needed to have boundaries about got great i'm glad to hear that Yes, and teddy bears. If you have stuffed animals, those are great too <laughs> to work with. <laughs> yes, thank you, Nikita. That's a cute one. Um, okay, so the next thing I want to share is um, it's a practice uh, where you're we're basically going to draw a line down the middle of our body. And so you're going to just basically like kind of knife your hands like this, and you're going to start at the top of your head, and you're going to draw a line down the mid the, down the midline like you're basically right in half and just tracing the whole body. And I'll share in a moment why we're doing this. <laughs> and then just kind of trace the insides of your legs all the way down or on the, maybe the tops of your legs, just kind of making contact with the two halves of your body. And the reason why we do this, and we can just do it a couple more times as I explain, but this is basically just to, to help our brains and our nervous systems to remember that we have two halves, that we have a structure 
and that the structure is made out of bones, right? We have a skeleton. You can feel your bones in, on certain parts of your body. And that we have muscles and tissues, right? And ligaments and organs that are all around the bones, right? So we have these two halves. And so just notice how you feel for a moment. So just pausing. It might seem like a silly kind of insignificant thing to do, but is there a, an effect that you're feeling? Do you feel more integrated? Do you feel more in your body? And it's okay if the answer to that is no, um, but just a moment to kind of check in and see if there's any result, any feedback from doing that. And just in general with um, somatic work, the goal is to really draw a yes around whatever's there. So whatever sensation is present, it's like draw a yes around it. Like when in doubt, just validate that it's real, validate that it's a thing that's happening in your body. And really the body just wants to be witnessed, just like a child, right? Or an animal in some cases. And so how do we bear witness to the body from a place of curiosity and compassion, right? Like, oh, wow, I'm really feeling a lot of anxiety and tightness in my chest. Wow, that's, that's really hard right now. And even just putting your hand on your chest, for example, um, can be a really helpful like self-regulation and self-compassion practice. So if you want to try this, you can. You don't have to. And obviously any of this uh, is, is optional. I forgot to mention that earlier, but... All of it is optional, so if anything ever doesn't feel right for you, just stop doing it and reorient to your senses. But if you just place your hand on your heart, and you can place your other hand either on the base of your neck, kind of gently at the base of the skull, or if that doesn't feel good for any reason, you can place that hand on your forehead. Or if you wanna just do the hand on the heart, that's fine too but we're just gonna experience these gentle holds. And this is a, another way of resourcing our bodies from a place of compassion. And you can close your eyes if you want, or you can keep your eyes open, but just notice how it feels to have your own hands, your own powerful energy fill, filled hands to be in contact with these very vulnerable and very tender parts of the body right? The base of the spine is where all the nerves come up through the spine and go into the brain. So it's a really like intense part of the body that can hold on to a lot of tension and strain. And so just noticing how it feels to feel held there, if that's where your hand is. Same thing with your frontal brain, if your hand is on your forehead. And of course the chest, right, is so tender and can feel so much constriction and tension and pain sometimes. Grief is so up for us right now collectively because of what's happening. And of course it's bringing up unresolved grief or unexpressed grief from the past and potentially from generations past. And so just noticing what happens when you just provide a little bit of support to yourself through your hands. Do you feel like you're a little bit more present in your body? Is it helpful or is it not helpful? Just tuning in and noticing. And then we're gonna do one more thing together and then I know we have to come to a close, unfortunately, but I'll share some, some opportunities to, uh, to continue together. Interesting, Orion. Interesting, um, noticing there, yeah. Um, so I wanna uh, invite you all to actually try um, a, wait, I wanna pause around this for a moment. Both the pushing of the hands forward and the two sides thing actually seem to create a heightened stimulated experience. Yeah, all right, so yeah, so I just wanna name that um, the, the, um, the pushing exercise, this is something to just 
you know, like if this didn't feel helpful for you, that's okay. Just, just omit that from your, from your toolbox. The, the line thing, um, you know, same thing. Like if that brought up more stimulation for you and that didn't feel good, then I would back out of it. Um, sometimes it's okay if these things create a little bit more activation, as long as we feel supported to work with the activation, if that makes sense. Um, so activation is not a bad thing right? It's just, do we have the support to actually work with it and discharge it? And so the next thing that we're going to do is actually an opportunity to really discharge a lot of activation from the nervous system. So we're actually going to shake. So this is like the grand finale. And if, <laughs> if this doesn't feel good for you, like if shaking is too much stimulation, if it makes you feel worse, then again, just don't do it. And you can just bear witness and hold space for others or just do whatever you need to do to take care of yourself. And I'm going to invite you to either sit or stand. I'm going to stay seated, but I welcome you to stand up if you want to, because this can be like something that you do just sit seated with just your upper body, or it can be a whole body experience. And so what I invite you to do is to actually just start to shake your hands and notice how that feels. And if that feels okay, start to shake your arms a little bit more and maybe a little bit bigger. And you can kind of titrate it, right? Titrate means like little bits at a time so that you're not going like zero to 60. You're building progressively while you're staying in your window of tolerance. And it's like you're that animal, right? In the wild and you're discharging. You're discharging excess energy, survival energy, fight energy, flight energy, anything that's been pent up or that's been activated that you wanna just like, it's almost like you're flicking it out of your body. You're shaking it out. And if you're using your whole body, you can shake your legs, you can shake your booty, you can shake your feet, you can shake your head, and you can make noises, right? That's the great thing about being on mute is you can make whatever noises you want right now. Pretend like you're an animal. What noises would you make if you're an animal trying to discharge a whole bunch of trauma that got stuck in your nervous system? And, you know, again, Staying within your window of tolerance. So backing out of it and slowing down a little bit if it feels like too much. And continuing to breathe into sensation and then start to kind of slow it down. And come to a place of relative stillness. You can still kind of have subtle movements if you want, but generally just kind of come to a landing place to just notice sensation, like notice how you feel. Is there a little bit more spaciousness in your body, a little bit more maybe what you would call organization or coherence? Do you feel a little bit more access to your, to your body, to, to the present moment? Yeah. Okay, so Ariana is saying, wow, I feel like I could take a nap. So one of the things that sometimes happens when we actually start to downshift the nervous system and regulate is we actually get really tired because we're attuning to our actual level of energy. And we can tend to then want to sort of catch up on sleep because we're actually not overriding our nervous system in order to push ourselves to do whatever we think we have to do, right? Or to try to survive, right? It's that survival strategy that we can kind of get stuck into. Yeah, so relaxed ribs, deeper breath, more spaciousness than dropped in, feel very present in the body, so much joy and silliness, <laughs> great, awesome, yeah. So, yeah, great, more aware of everything going on in the body and in the emotions, awesome. I remember why I used to dance, but didn't know it, <laughs> great, yeah. So um, this is just a little sampling, and um, I hope that this was helpful. I want to just share real quick before I hand it back over to my sister, Aria, that I'm going to be offering a extended version of this with, with less talking and more practice um, starting next week on Tuesday nights from 5.30 to 7. And this will just be kind of a six-week series, um, drop-in series, uh, just to, to practice together and to help regulate. It's going to be sliding scale. Um, with the option to pay zero if that's the, what's best for you right now. And so I'll be emailing everybody with the information for that if you want to drop into it. Um, it'll be, um, yeah, just in service to helping us all resource ourselves and regulate during this time together. So um, thank you so much for um, 
being here with me tonight. And um, I hope to see you all again soon. And um, please reach out if there's anything I can do to support you. I do work one-on-one -on -one with people um, with one-to-one um, -one somatic experiencing sessions if you could use some private support. And I do offer that on a sliding scale right now. So please reach out and um, sending lots of love to everybody. And uh, back to you, Aria. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Really, um, really fun to do these practices and see everyone on the video um, and n notice what's what's changed in my body since we first hopped on here. Um, really grateful for all that you shared and uh, love love the 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 drop in class that you're creating and um, I really highly recommend one-on-one -on -one work with Elizabeth as well. Um, it's so powerful, you guys. There's, there's so much that um, is uh, oftentimes stored in the body, um, whatever your life experience has been. And so being able to clear in some of that old, old energy out to, to make way for the, um, the free state, I love that as the new term, to be able to respond in situations like um, the one we're currently in from a, from a really grounded embodied place is um, it, it's such a gift. So thank you for bringing this work to the world. And um, yeah, we'll wrap up in, in just a minute, gang. Um, so much gratitude to all of you for, for coming with your curiosity. Um, I want to just mention that um, the, the kind of final uh, piece for this Rise in Resiliency um, chapter is happening Friday night at 8 o'clock. It's going to be a sharing circle. I know many, uh, many of you have been dropping into those the last couple of weeks. Um, the, you'll receive an email with that information as well as this recording if you want to share the recording with anyone or come back to, um, to watch it down the road, um, as well as recordings from the, the other five, um, five guests that we've had. And um, Rise and Resiliency is going to continue um, also uh, in, a, in a group uh, weekly way. It'll be a little more interactive. It will still include some special guests along the way. Um, I'm kind of setting it up as a, a group coaching experience. Um, and uh, also a sliding scale rate. So if you're wanting to just have some uh, additional support, additional community um, in, in the journey that we are all in right now, um, there'll be some information sent out also by email or you can find me and follow me on Facebook if we're not already friends. And um, yeah, so much, um, so much gratitude to, to all of you. Oh, also thanking the organizations um, that have been helping to, to promote this. Um, uh, there are several orgs around Michigan, and I won't um, name them all because we're a little over in time, but uh, I invite you to read, read in the email and visit those websites. I know um, Title Track is one um, that both um, Elizabeth and Seth uh, Bernard, who's here, are involved in, and they have a beautiful fundraiser going on right now, raising money um, for the Native American elders in Northern Michigan to have what they need during this time and be supported in a good way. So if you are able to contribute to that campaign or support any of the local businesses that are doing good work in the world, um, I invite you to, to check that out as well. Um, so thank you again, everyone. Really so honored that we um, got to be together. Thank you again, Elizabeth. And uh, here's to resiliency in our bodies, minds, hearts, spirits. Let's take, um, oh, we've been doing this to close. This is a mirror, mirror neuron thing, I guess. Um, if everyone wants to rub your, if you want, you can rub your hands together really fast and build up some heat and energy. And then with your exhale, just sending love, sending healing out to the whole world right now, to all of those um, who are experiencing symptoms or grief or helping in the healing arts. Thank you, thank you, thank you to the earth, to each other. Mm.
All right. Have a blessed evening. Mm -hmm. Big love. Thanks, everybody. Mm -hmm. Good night. Thanks, mm -hmm. everyone, for the birthday wishes, too. Love you guys. Happy birthday. <laughs> Happy birthday. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>